Hi, this is Steve Tobias with NearFX giving the tip of the week spectral decomposition and paleo scan. What it's all about and how to do it a little better. Uh, and for those that missed last week, uh, I think it's worthwhile just briefly reviewing the fact that uh, last week talked about horizon stacks, what they are and how to make them a little better. If you follow that red arrow on the right, you can see just above it is a yellow horizon that's part of a horizon stack. And that horizon stack creates the framework within the relative geologic time model to create the attribute maps that you're seeing on the left. The top two attribute maps, left is relative acoustic impedance, which shows the facies more than anything else. And the right one is the thinnest parameter, which, as I'll discuss in later episodes, is a, a good approximation under certain assumptions of the instantaneous accommodation space that occurred during deposition. And if you'll notice, it's kind of lumpy, the top two maps. And the reason for that is that the uh, horizon stack was undersampled. In contrast, the two maps below show uh, a much more intuitive, satisfying view of the chronology of the deposition for this in this area that's characterized by very complex stratigraphy. This week we're going to talk about spectral decomposition and how that can really take a stratigraphic study to the next level. So what it, what's it all about? What, it, what it's all about is to find a way to better discriminate between uh, target areas such as this geobody of interest and the country rock in, into which it's been deposited. Spectral decomposition is really, really simple conceptually. You take a box around the zone of interest and for every trace in that seismic line, you try to figure out, well, what frequencies are in that trace? And you get what's called a frequency spectrum. Uh, there's no energy at zero hertz over here, and there's really nothing above 60 or 65 hertz. Everything is in between that, maybe starting a little bit north of 5 hertz and ending somewhere around 45 or 50 hertz, something like that. And so what we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that the signature we're looking here changes for different geology and how to take those thumbprints and turn that into a more intelligent stratigraphic analysis. Well, as I've said, the way to do it is really pretty simple. Uh, you take the zone of interest and you break it into primary colors. So what we'll do in this particular case is say everything here is going to be red. What's, what's red? Oh, I guess about 12 hertz up to 22 hertz. And similarly, we're going to make everything in this zone green and everything in this zone blue. And that gives us a way to create a color key that's tied to the signature of the stratigraphy that we're looking at. And well, here's what you get when you do the process, that same seismic line now. It goes from white to black with colors in between. Uh, you know something? It just doesn't look that valuable. But hold on. You'll see in a second why it really is. The first step in making this a really usable product is to go ahead and try to understand a little better what the signature is for the zone of interest. And the signature is going to have some sort of a response on a spectrogram. Some people call it frequency gathers. And you can see what this is all about is you go from 0 hertz way up to 100 hertz. In fact, uh, everything past around 60 is, is pretty useless. So when you look at the spectrogram, you realize what's going on is that the interpreter or PaleoScan user can move a cursor back and forth and hold it over the zone of interest. And when they do, you can see that the particular zone of interest will have a certain signature. And the question is, how do we go ahead and take that signature and discriminate against the other rocks? 
Well, when looking at the signature, and this is the signature that goes all the way from about 0 hertz way out to 60, 70 hertz, that's pretty boring and monotonous, and that's the signature of the zone of interest. Uh, now, one thing to notice that's really kind of interesting is that uh, what we're looking at over here is a spectrogram that has a lot of detail, a lot of fine, thin detail. And that's good, right? Well, not necessarily. Because if you go ahead and say, let's increase the thinness of the window that we're analyzing from th three samples or 12 milliseconds over to something that's larger, what you'll see is you'll lose the detail in the thin bedding, but you'll start to get more of a signature. Let's, let's take a look at that. Here what we're doing is we're going up uh, to 43, 55 different samples and back. And as we do that, you can see you're trading off vertical resolution for frequency resolution. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this and a lot of ways to select the correct parameters, and everybody has a different approach, and no one's wrong and no one's right. What I like to do is to increase the sample size up to a point where I can still recognize what's going on stratigraphically, and I call it a day for now. That's for my design. My design will be 21 samples and 84 milliseconds. And so for many people applying spectral decomposition for the delineation of geology, geobodies, and stratigraphy, they're kind of done. They take a look at the optimal window size and say, you know, this is the geobody I want to find everywhere in my volume. I'm going to keep all three of my red, green, and blue colors within the energy. The reason for that is real straightforward. Red, green, and blue together make white. And so you create a spectral decomposition of this volume and geobodies like this will jump out at you with that signature as white and that is a very satisfactory solution for a lot of cases. Sure, it makes sense to have a spectral decomposition capability to bring out geobodies, and a lot of people do that. But quite often, there's other information, stratigraphic information, that's not present at the frequencies found only in the geobody. And let me just walk through an approach to create a spec decomp volume that can bring out more stratigraphic detail. If we start by looking at the area of the anomaly over here and see how the character changes as we go through the different frequencies from low to high, you'll notice it goes from continuous to compartmentalized and back. It's, uh, it's really, uh, there's a lot of information all over the spectrum there. So one way and one, one approach is to start here and say, well, let's, let's go ahead and take uh, that as one of our RGB levels. But take a look here. You can see there's some compartmentalization that was only found at the higher frequencies up here. And in addition, you've got some continuity that the low frequencies are bringing out. And so there's complex intersecting faces in your data and it's important to capture the right frequencies in RGB. Now this is especially true in carbonate terrains for a variety of reasons which I'll go over in some other episode. This slide summarizes the second spectral decomposition that I've done for this data volume. Uh, in contrast to the first one, I've spread out the RGB values, and the reason again is the high frequency value at 37 hertz seems to have captured some stratigraphic detail that is absent 
by the high amplitude overwhelming response of the geobody itself. In a similar manner, there's some continuity that is captured by the lower frequencies. At this point, it's important to briefly measure, mention that those using elastic inversion as input and can modify chi angles to come up with fluid volumes and lithology volumes had better spend a lot of time preparing separate spectral decomposition uh, values and parameters uh, for the two cases for obvious reasons. Well, let's try to bring it all together and see what three different criteria for the selection of spec decomp parameters gets you. Once again, we're going to start at a straddle slice at the bottom of the zone of interest, and we're going to just take it up and look at what it looks like on the three different results. On the left is going to be a real thin spectral decomposition. It's going to show better fine layering, but you know what? It's just not going to have a lot of different signatures for the different bodies. And because of that, it's going to be limited in its utilization. This might be considered to be the, uh, the best of the three for this particular problem. I've thickened the window out to uh, 23 samples, and uh, we've spread apart the red, green, blue to capture some stratigraphic detail that isn't present at only the central frequencies. And uh, this one, I can't say it's wrong, it's just more optimized so that the geobody itself is the thing of interest for uh, quantitative interpretation and resource evaluation purposes. Perhaps that's the way to go. And when you start looking at the three of them, you can see right away that there is a lot of different character going on here. Now it's kind of fast and I'm going to take some snapshots and show them as I close up the presentation. But the emphasis here is that you just can't do spec decomp in PaleoScan and expect to have results that are competitive with others in the industry. You have to spend a lot of time putting it together and most importantly all your spectral decomposition should be specific to the sequence boundary of interest. And Later on we'll talk about how to use PaleoScan to better delineate sequence boundaries, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. Well this slide and the next one are the two snapshots I said I'd show you. On the left is the thin window stratigraphic centric spec decomp, and uh, as we as we discussed, well, you can see stratigraphy there, but you see how washed out the colors are. That's because you're just not getting the frequency resolution you need to distinguish between the different stratigraphic bodies. On the other hand. The one on the right, which we call optimal, has some real interesting information that sure hints at facies variations. Why are we seeing it here? It's two reasons. The window is bigger, we get better frequency discrimination, and uh, also we're separating out the RGB so that we're capturing different parts of the spectrum that are fit for purpose for this particular problem. And this final comparison shows on the left the same optimal example that we just looked at. And on the right, uh, a different approach. This is the one where those three RGB uh, vectors were pretty close together. And as promised, the geobody is much more white than you see in the colorful example to the left. So what are we doing here? This is a wonderful recon approach for where you're going to quickly see in that white color the geobody of interest and for resource evaluation, uh, economic input, probably the way to go. But if you're doing say artificial intelligence applications and you want to tie in log character with seismic character to try to understand facies development so your geocellular models a little better, you want to go with the one on the left. But importantly, 
Each time you start doing a sequence uh, uh, spectral decomposition exercise, it has to be fit for purpose for this seismic sequence of interest. Well, I started off this presentation by reviewing last week's construction of horizon stacks and why it's very important to get the right number of slices or spatial resolution in your RGT model so that you can get a much better feel for the geology and the environment at deposition as the pair on the right show. Today I talked about spectral decomposition and why that's the next step that's necessary in order to better understand the stratigraphy and the targets that you're chasing. This comparison from slice 68 and the sequence we've been looking at gives you a good idea of just how much more stratigraphic information you can get from spectral decomposition. This second example is even more interesting uh, from slice 89. If you look at the right, sure, you can see there's a stratigraphic feature over here. And this is with a uh, straightforward relative acoustic impedance amp attribute map. But contrast that to what you're seeing over here. Clearly, anybody trying to put together a field de development program or de-risk a prospect is going to find this much more useful. Uh, the detail is really much better most of the time with spectral decomposition, as you can see. This third and final example is probably uh, the most stunning of the set. On the left, I've chosen to use the spectral decomposition that enhances in white the geobody of interest. And on the right, again, is relative acoustic impedance. It's a slice. And by looking at this, you can get a really good feel for what spectral decomposition can do for you. It's especially valuable in PaleoScan simply because it's so well integrated. To be sure, there are many good companies that provide very good spectral decomposition. But if you're going to be using PaleoScan, it's really worthwhile learning how to do it right. I'd like to thank you for the time you spent listening to this uh, presentation today. Clearly, spectral decomposition and paleoscan is a very powerful tool for the study of stratigraphy. It gives you a lot of flexibility, a lot of ways to go about reaching the goals that you need to reach in your work because it's so highly integrated. It's important to carefully select parameters that are fit for purpose for the challenges at hand. Because of the highly interactive nature, uh, it's a straightforward task as I'll be discussing more in the coming weeks with further episodes. NearFX offers advanced project training and execution for PaleoScan and other, other tools uh, in use by the exploration and production community. Topics covered in our training include model building and PaleoScan and poor signal to noise. Uh, use of the uh, new 2019 release fault capabilities, uh, sequence stratigraphic workflows, best practices, and geobody mapping, applying spectral decomposition properly, and there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, the power of the thinning attribute and its ability to approximate instantaneous accommodation space to better understand risk in new prospects integrations with logs, structural geology, including forward modeling, pound spastic restoration, and more. Uh, please visit our website at nearfx.com. Uh, if anyone is interested in any training, uh, we're happy to come in with a free lunch and learn. Just send an email to myself, Steve Tobias, at steve at nearfx.com. Have a nice day.